All right, welcome everyone to this RSET training on NASA's Atmospheric Composition Ground Network Supporting Air Quality and Climate Applications. Before we get started, i just give like to give you a brief overview of the RSET program. RSET, which is the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, provides accessible, relevant, and cost-free trainings on remote sensing using satellites and other methods such as ground networks, which we'll be talking about today. These trainings cover a variety of different application areas, as you can see on the right of the slide here. This particular training is in the health and air quality application area. These trainings address a variety of applications in these areas and are tailored to a variety of different audiences with different experience levels. RSET provides both online training, such as the one you're attending today, as well as in-person trainings. The trainings can be live and instructor-led, such as today's training, or asynchronous self-paced trainings. However, all of our trainings are cost-free. Several trainings are available in bilingual or multilingual options. We only use open source software and data in our trainings, as we'll see in part two of this training series. And we modify our trainings to accommodate a variety of different levels of expertise. This session in particular is geared towards those with intermediate levels of expertise. You can visit the RSET website to learn more about these trainings and others. So now moving into the topic of this training series, which is the atmospheric composition ground networks, which support air quality and climate applications. If you've attended any previous RSET trainings, you've probably learned about the different kinds of satellite instruments which provide remote sensing data from space. What you might not know is that NASA also operates ground-based remote sensing networks. NASA's atmospheric composition ground networks, which are the Aeronet, Pandora, Tollnet, and MPLnet instruments and networks, provide information on aerosols and trace gases in the atmosphere, including vertical profile and column information, and support a wide range of applications from air quality tracking to climate modeling. The bottom-up view that these instruments give us often complements the top-down view which we get from satellites. And this also allows ground-based networks to give us certain types of information which are very difficult to get with satellites. For example, looking at what's happening in the lowest levels of the atmosphere, which is most relevant to where we live and breathe. Over the course of this training series, We'll learn about all these different networks, the types of data they collect, and how these data are used in air quality and climate applications, such as improving atmospheric models or providing continuity between different satellite missions. By the end of this training series, we hope that our participants will be able to first identify the basic characteristics, capabilities, and limitations of the NASA instruments used by these ground networks for active and passive remote sensing of aerosols, ozone, and nitrogen dioxide. Second, to recognize how these ground-based networks sustain global long-term observation, support air quality and climate applications, and how they complement satellite-based remote sensing. Third, we'll be showing you how to access relevant atmospheric composition data from the appropriate NASA ground networks for given locations and, and application purposes. And finally, we'll show you how to compare and jointly analyze specific ground-based atmospheric composition data products with relevant satellite-based remote sensing data, for example, satellite aerosol data products for given location and time. As a prerequisite to this course, we recommend you taking a look at this introductory training on how NASA measures air pollution. This covers some of the basic concepts which will be further expanded on in this training. In part one today, we'll be taking an introduction to the aerosol robotic network or Aeronet. Next week in part two, we'll continue with a hands-on analysis of Aeronet data before moving in part three to an introduction to the Pandora instrument and the Pandonia global network. Then in part four, we'll move on to an introduction to the tropospheric ozone LIDAR network or TOLNET. And finally in part five, an introduction to the micropulse LIDAR network or MPLnet. The homework for this training series will be offered beginning at the end of part five and you'll have two weeks to complete that homework assignment. The due date is September 5th. Those who attend all five of the live sessions of this training series, as well as complete the homework assignment for the given due date, will receive a certificate of completion for the course. Now, let's start off with part one of this training series, looking at Aeronet. 
My name is Dr. Carl Mellings. I'm an assistant research scientist at Morgan State University under the Guest R2 Cooperative Agreement, and I've been given the introduction to this training. And shortly, I'll be handing the training over to Dr. Pawan Gupta, a co-lead of the Aeronet Network from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center to present most of the technical material. By the end of this part, we hope that our participants will be able to identify the basic characteristics of the Aeronet instruments used by NASA for ground-based passive remote sensing of aerosols, and also recognize how Aeronet networks sustain global long-term observations, support air quality and climate applications, and complement satellite aerosol data. To review some prior knowledge that you'll want to be familiar with before this training course, Aerosols are solid or liquid particles which are suspended in the atmosphere and impact air quality, weather, climate, and human health, and animal and environmental health as well in a variety of different ways. Passive remote sensing instruments rely on direct or indirect reflected or scattered sunlight as the source of the electromagnetic radiation they detect. If you've taken previous ARSA trainings, you might be familiar with some of the satellite instruments which provide information about aerosols. These include the MODIS instrument, the VIRS instrument, the ABI instrument on the GO series of satellites, as well as several of the instruments on the newly launched PACE satellite. Those missions will come up a little bit later in today's training as well. If you have questions at any point during today's training, please put them in the questions box within WebEx and we'll be answering answering all of those questions together at the end of the training today. You can answer, enter the questions in the questions box at any time, and we'll be answering them, as I said, at the end of the training. We'll be collecting all the questions and answers together into a training document, which will be posted on the training website about a week after the conclusion of the training. And any questions we don't get to answer during the live portion of the Q&A will still be answered in that training document posted to the website. So now, without any further ado, I'd like to hand us over to Dr. Pawan Gupta to tell us about Aeronet. Thank you, Carl, for that great introduction and uh, uh, details about the RSET and the training. So in part one, we are going to talk about uh, aerosol robotic network or commonly known as Aeronet. And I'm going to talk about brief history of Aeronet, details of instrumentations, and uh, get to some of the applications. Okay, so the first one is overview, Aeronet overview. What you see on the right on the map are the locations of all the Aeronet station ever deployed all around the world. Uh, Aeronet program is a federation of ground-based remote sensing aerosol networks. So it is a networks of networks and we'll explain that in more details. The primary purpose of Aeronet is to get columnar atmospheric aerosol measurements from the ground stations. So these are considered ground truth. It provides long-term, uh, continuous, and readily accessible public domain database. This is very, very important. There are many, many networks all around the world operated by many other agencies. But one of the beautiful thing about Aeronet is the data are in public domain and anyone who likes to use the data can opt in that. So that's a very, very important part of Aeronet. It includes data sets on aerosol, optical, microphysical, and radiative properties. And all of these are very useful for air quality and climate change research. The network imposes standardization. Again, very important for Aeronet is the standardization. Please, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more when we get to the instrumentation, calibration, data processing, and distribution. Although it is a network of network, but throughout all the networks across all the globes, we use same instrument, same calibration process, data processing happens using same algorithms, and they are all distributed through NASA Goddard Aeronet website. As I mentioned, Aeronet data has been extensively used in aerosol research to characterize atmospheric aerosols, to validate the satellite retrievals, and model outputs, and most importantly, to address the climate and air quality applications throughout the history of Aeronet. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Aeronet background or historical perspective. So Aeronet was uh, stabilized by NASA and Photons, uh, a group 
out of University of Lille in France in 1993 with one station here at NASA Goddard. And since then, the network has expanded by joining other networks, regional networks called RIMA and Aero Spain. These are two in out from the Spain uh, Aero CAN, which is a Canadian aerosol networks. NEON is a national ecological observatory network funded by National Science Foundation here in the US. And then the CASNET, which is a part of Chinese Aeronet network. In addition to that, uh, Aeronet also has something called Aerospan, uh, Aero which is a, a small network out of from Australia. In addition to that, uh, there are thousands of collaborators with national and international agencies, which includes uh, public and private sector institutes, universities, and individual scientists and partners who actually contributed heavily on Aeronet. And as I mentioned, we started in 1993, so we have 30 years of data records from some of the sites. So as I mentioned earlier, it's a network of networks and it started in 1993. So what you see on the left side with one square dot, which is first location at NASA Goddard started back in May 1993. So we have a completed 30 years data records from that one site. And then it grows to the what you see in last year, May 2023, the locations of all the stations all around the world. So in the last 30 years, it has grown a lot. Currently, we have about 600 active stations. Over the time, we have about 1,800 station deployment, which means some of the sites have been decommissioned for various logistic and other reasons, and some of the new sites comes along every year. Uh, Aeronet coverage is across 100 gaps in many areas around the world, uh, specifically over Africa and over northern uh, hemisphere, over Russia and other places uh, due to uh, geopolitical issues and uh, difficulty in uh, maintaining stations on these locations. Here are uh, some of the locations or the networks which are part of Aeronet program. The first picture you see here is from the NASA Goddard. We have a calibration centers and one of the major Aeronet uh, uh, lab here, uh, which have capability to calibrate 100 instrument on a given day in time. Then we have photons on the top, which is in Lille, France, uh, Aerospan, uh, we have neon. Neon is very deep. These are also located in very difficult locations. And typically these uh, instrument, sun photometer is mounted on actually with many other instruments on these kind of towers, which you see here in the picture on the right corner. Then you have some sites in uh, Australia. We have AeroCan Canadian sites, which are really in difficult uh, locations under snow and ice conditions. So they operate certain time of the years only. So this is just to give you a glimpse of what different sites looks like or where those different networks operates. Now, the growth didn't happen overnight, as we mentioned earlier. It took 30 years. And what you see on the bottom of the time series is the number of sites which came along, added into the Aeronet networks over the years. So if you do a trend fit, it's about 25 sites, which are which we include new sites in Aeronet networks uh, combined from all the networks which are part of Aeronet. And you can see how the locations of those sites have been evolving over the time in the map on the right, uh, on the top. And the colors are basically mean aerosol optical depth for that particular years, which we uh, the station is displayed. The AOD is represented at 500 nanometer, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, what it means. Here is some more details about some of the sites which came along in last three to four years, uh, starting 2020 to 23. As you can see, uh, 2020 
and 21, 22, those two and more than two years were heavily affected by the COVID uh, all over the world and their net operation also got affected because it was very, very hard to maintain those sites. But still, we were able to put a lot of sites during that period and after that period in many, many different parts of the world. Uh, you can see the deployment, uh, the colors on the map doesn't have any relevance here, but you see the, uh, the locations of the new sites which came along. We are already in discussion uh, with many different countries, uh, including US, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, India, and other countries in Africa where new sites in coming year will come up, uh, which is about 20 more sites. Now, if you look at the data records, availability of data records for various climate and air quality research, then we have about 30 years data records from one site that was has Goddard. Uh, if you're looking for uh, more sites, then we have about 20 years of data records from 71 sites uh, uh, spread across the region. So you can see very quickly in the first 10 year itself, we went from one site to 70 site. The 10 year plus data records is available from more than 350 sites. So huge change in last 10 years, all the way from 70 sites to uh, 350 sites. And if you're looking for five years plus data records, then we have about 565 sites. Uh, as I mentioned, currently we have about 600 active sites all around the globe. Okay, now in addition to these uh, permanent Aeronet sites. Aeronet also heavily involved in supporting field campaign. And these field campaigns can be NASA or non NASA, depending on the purpose of the field campaign. And Aeronet participate in all kinds of field campaigns since the beginning of the program until current time. Uh, what we call it's Dragon, the uh, Regional Aerosol Graded Observation Network. Uh, distributed uh, uh, regional aerosol graded observation network or dragon. So the dragons, the concept of the dragon is that you put many, many aeronet sites in a smaller regions to observe or to measure aerosol gradients in a space and time or a smaller regions. And one of the example, if you see here on the left side in this animation is a similar dragon deployed in 2011 during a Discover AQ field campaign here in Washington DC and Baltimore area, where we had 40 plus CML instrument operated for many months to actually capture that spatial and temporal variability in this region. Similarly, we have deployed these dragon networks in LA, in Houston, in Colorado, all supporting Discovery AQ field campaign and internationally. We have these Dragon deployment in UAE over India. Most recent one, which we just did earlier this year, was called Core, uh, Asia AQ field campaign, which was deployed in Thailand, uh, Philippines, and South Korea and Taiwan. So those four countries actually covered during this. And these uh, high density networks can be very, very useful, not only to assess the spatial gradient, but to validate the satellite data at high spatial resolution, which are becoming more and more available using the new sensors. So if you have these high resolution satellite data, which is about one kilometer to 10 kilometer resolution, uh, this Dragon Network can be significant, add the value to the quality of the data in, in assessing the quality of satellite data. Okay, here I just want to quickly show some of the example of aeronet deployment uh, from different sites. And these are just some example. What I want to point out is that if you look these each deployment, they are each of these are different uh, in many things. Some of them are deployed on a tower, which is designed, designed uh, specifically for observation. Some of them are just on the roof of schools, or some of them are in open field on the ground, surrounded by mining activities or lake, and some of them are in the uh, agriculture field. So 
all 600 sites provide very unique perspective in their own way uh, about aerosol measurements and they cover all kind of land use land change uh, scenarios different environmental condition different climatic conditions from extreme heat in saharan sahara to extreme cold in alaska and canada and uh, greenland and south pole so we have aeronet measurements in different uh, environmental condition, different climate conditions to assess how the aerosols are actually evolving around the world. So before we move forward, I just want to pause for 10, 15 seconds here. If people have questions, they can put it on the chat box, the question answer box, and then I will move on. Okay, so I hope that allowed you to think about any question you may have or put in the question answer box. So let's move on. I talked about the bigger picture of Aer uh, Aeronet network. Now, I, before we get into more details, I want to uh, make sure that everybody understand what Aeronet measures and what kind of things. Uh, and since this is an air quality application training, I want to make sure we make that link very early how this aeronet measurements are linked to air quality, how, how they are different and how they are similar. So let's look into some of these uh, terminologies which you will hear throughout the uh, uh, first two sessions. Okay, so the first one is called aerosol optical depth. That's the fundamental measurement done by aeronet and it's an optical measurement of the atmosphere. Okay, as some people it also called an aerosol optical thickness commonly known as AOD or AOT, it is always represented at certain wavelengths. So whenever you're saying AOD, you must mention at what wavelength the measurements are done. Typically, for most climate application, the measurements are done at the green channel, either 500 nanometer or 550 nanometers, but it all Aeronet along with other instrument can make measurements in other wavelength as well. So what is aerosol optical depth? It is uh, it is optical depth express the quantity of light removed from a beam by scattering or absorption during its path through a medium. So let's lo look this first bullet a little bit more closely. So you have a sun, which is a source of energy, which is uh, transmitting electromagnetic spectrum in all kinds of wavelengths which reaches to the top of the atmospheres and enter to the atmosphere. When it enters the atmosphere, it interact with the atmospheric component, which are cloud, water vapor, gases, and aerosols, which are small particles in the atmosphere. And then whatever is transmitted through these uh, atmospheric component reaches to the surface, and that's where the aeronet instrument is sitting and looking towards the sun directly within 1.2 degree field of view. So what Aeronet does is it makes measurements of this incoming irradiance in a specific wavelength by looking directly to the sun passing through the atmosphere, right? So now if let's say, if we know I0, which is how much top of the atmosphere irradiance in particular channel is, and if we measure I, which is measured by this instrument, then we can tell by looking the difference how much irradiance in that particular wavelength is attenuated or removed by these particles or clouds or water vapor or anything else which is there in the atmosphere. So that is the basic principle of making measurement of aerosol optical depth. Now, in this case, we have shown US and photometer. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but there is also another instrument which is shown here is called Microtops, and I'll talk to that about that as well. 
Now, the aerosol optical depth represent the loading of the particles in the entire column of the atmosphere. As you can see from the measurement picture, what we are measuring is how much radiation is reaching to the surface. So it represents the entire column. We are not able to separate in the surface or different layers of the atmosphere. It represents the entire column of the atmosphere from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. The value depends on many things. So we'll talk about how to separate into different component, but the value of this aerosol optical depth depends on particle concentration, how many particles are there, what kind of shapes, like dust particle have a different type of shapes versus smoke particles versus pollution particles in the, in the urban environment may have a different shape. Size also matters. Uh, their chemical composition, in other words, refractive index, can will tell us whether they are refractive, they are a scattering type of aerosol or absorbing type of aerosols, and where they are in the atmosphere. Although we are making a columnar measurement, but it matters whether they are in lower atmosphere, upper atmosphere, or middle atmosphere, depending on their location, this aerosol optical depth value can have a different meaning. And then the wavelength at which you are making measurements. So like I said earlier, aerosol optical depth, always specified by the wavelength and its value will change depending on which wavelength we are showing the measurement. And like I mentioned, it can measure from the ground as well as from the space. So looking a little bit more into mathematical form, how the AOD is calculated. So typically this is represented by what we call lambert weir law or weir lambert law. And as from the previous picture, I is the measurement which we are making at the surface using the sun photometer, and the I zero is the top of the atmosphere irradiance in that particular wavelength. Uh, M theta is uh, what we call is optical air mass, and theta is the solar zenith angle, and one over cosine of solar zenith angle is what M is defined by, and the tau lambda is optical depth of the atmosphere. So it includes optical depth of the atmosphere. This is not yet aerosol optical depth. This is optical depth of the atmosphere, which have air, aerosols, and gases. So now let's assume this measurement of I is done under cloud-free condition. When there was no cloud, we did this measurement. So when there is no cloud, what are the other component which are there in the atmosphere which will have impact on this I value which we measured? We will have air particles, which is also called Rayleigh particles. So this is called optical depth by air molecules or Rayleigh optical depth, which we can calculate very accurately using air pressures measured at the surface. So this is a quantity very accurately can be calculated and we can remove this from the total atmospheric optical depth. Then we have aerosol optical depth. This is our interest. This is what we want, okay? And then we have gases. So for example, uh, ozone, uh, NO2, SO2, uh, water vapor, um, all of the carbon dioxide, all the gases, depending on which wavelength you are making measurement, these gases can have a different optical depth for the, on that particular wavelength. And again, based on our understanding and other type of measurement, we can calculate this gas aerosol, gas optical depth as well with high accuracies. So once you have measurement of total optical depth using this equation, we can actually remove the Rayleigh optical depth and gases optical depth to get aerosol optical depth. And that's how the aeronet actually get to the aerosol optical depth. Moving on, there is another parameter which is very important uh, in uh, come which comes from aeronet called angstrom parameter or typically alpha or some people also called it angstrom coefficient. They are all same. And what angstrom parameter or alpha tell us about is the size distribution or the what kind of particles dominated that particular atmospheric column where you are making measurement. And this is defined by this specific equation alpha, which is a 
measurement taken in two different wavelengths. So these are aerosol optical depth in two different wavelengths, wavelength one and wavelength two, and these are the actual wavelengths. So you take the logarithmic of the, the two and then the ratio, that is what the alpha is defined. Typically, this alpha is always represented by a pair of wavelengths. So in, in Aeronet, we define it for 450 to 870 nanometer. You can also use more than two wavelengths to calculate alpha by doing a least square fit. So there are many different ways. So again, whenever you are using angstrom parameter, always ask the question, which two wavelengths are how many different wavelength it represents because the value will change depending on which two wavelengths you are using or more wavelengths you are using and their interpretation will also change. So let's assume we are using these two wavelengths for 40 nanometer which is sensitive to absorbing aerosols in the low close to the UV part of the solar spectrum and 870 which is close to the near IR channels uh, representing high. Now, when you have the value of this alpha like greater than two, then basically it indicates that our, uh, the particles in the atmosphere are dominated by fine mode or a smaller size particles. These are typically urban pollution particles like sulfate, nitrate, or a smoke part, fine smoke particles. When this value is near zero or less than 0.5, it typically indicate the presence of coarse mode particles such as desert dust or uh, soil or um, sand particles in the atmosphere. Again, depending on the pair of the wavelength, this interpretation can change. Uh, but the angstrom parameter is kind of a quantitative way in which the we are using optical depth measured in different wavelength to assess the size. So the spectral dependency of aerosol or aerosol properties uh, are quantified by this angstrom parameter and very, very useful in assessing or identifying type of aerosols in the atmosphere. Okay, now how these things are linked or similar to aerosol optical depth or uh, what, uh, we call PM 2.5 in air quality community, how they are two quantities linked or uh, what kind of differences they have or similarities they have. So let's look first the PM 2.5, right? PM 2.5 is typically measured near the ground uh, or top of the building. Uh, and these are most likely point observations. The surface layer is the lowest layer of the atmosphere where we all breathe. Typically, its uh, thickness of this layer can be few tens of meters, up to 100 meters, or few kilometers, depending on the uh, mixing of boundary layer, uh, how the boundary layer is mixed. So this surface layer can vary, okay? Now, satellite or even the ground-based uh, aeronet aerosol optical depth, which we just discussed, represent the entire column of the atmosphere. So let's say this is a surface measurement of PM 2.5, but this is aerosol optical depth. Whether it's come, if it is coming from a sun photometer like Aeronet, that it will be a representing one point, point location similar to PM 2.5. But if it is coming from the satellite, then it will have a horizontal resolution also. So that cylinder of the atmosphere, which extended from the surface to the top of the atmosphere, will also have a certain diameter or radius. And this resolution can vary from one kilometer to 10 kilometer, depending on which satellite, what data product you are using. So this is main difference between uh, aerosol optical depth and PM 2.5 in terms of them, what they are measuring. Now, there are other differences. Uh, PM 2.5 is a mass concentration. Uh, and it is always uh, represented microgram per cubic meter. It's a dry mass, means it is measured under controlled uh, conditions by heating the air sample at 40% relative humidity, 35 to 40%. Where aerosol optical depth is actually represent all the particles in this column, all size, all shape, 
all kind of chemical composition, everything which is in this column is represented by optical depth. It's a unitless quantity. Optical depth is a unitless quantity and it is done in ambient conditions. So what, what I mean by ambient condition is we measure aerosol optical depth in the ambient condition where SPM 2.5 is a dry mass. Like I said, it's the sample is heated and then measured. So when you do the optical depth in ambient condition, quantities like water vapor um, can have a direct or indirect effect on aerosol optical depth. Right. So let's say you put the sulfate aerosols in urban environment with high relative humidity conditions, then the sulfate aerosol are hygroscopic in nature. They will grow in size and they'll absorb water vapor and grow in size and their optical properties will change and aerosol optical depth will increase. Whereas the, since we are only making dry mass of PM 2.5, your mass concentration may remain constant where aerosol optical depth can see the changes because of the high concentration of water vapor in the atmosphere. And there are other parameters which we already discussed. So although these two quantity have been heavily used in air quality research and application, there are significant differences in both of them. But both of them, one thing to important to note here is that both of them represent amount of pollution in the atmosphere. Yes, there are significant differences, but there are also similarities. Under certain conditions, under certain atmospheric condition with some assumptions, they can be highly correlated. And that is what we use actually uh, if you have looked any satellite derived PM 2.5 product, those assumptions, those equations, that's what we use to actually derive surface PM 2.5 concentration using aerosol optical depth. But this is also, I just want to make sure that everybody understand the differences before we start using aerosol optical depth data for air quality application. Okay, so let's move forward. Uh, let's get back to the Aeronet. And what we are going to talk now is what kind of instrument we use, uh, calibration, which is a backbone of our Aeronet network, and some of the data sets which we produce using these instrument from all around the world. Okay, so the first one is the instrumentation. The, the fundamental instrument which Aeronet use is called sun photometer. A sun photometer is nothing but a light meter that measures the amount of light within a very narrow range of wavelengths or colors within a very small field of view. So as I mentioned earlier, this, this head of the sun photometer, what we call is collimator, is looking or pointing towards the sun and it measures the incoming solar irradiance in particular wavelength at very small field of view, 1.2 degree field of view. Once the light passes through this, there are detectors, different wavelength detectors, which makes measurements and then we save the data. Uh, the one thing to note down about this instrument is, it's an automated system. So it not only has this uh, collimator and the sensor head where we record the data, but it also has a robot. And the robot is basically to track the sun. So it tracks the sun from morning to evening uh, using uh, automated programming. And then we have a control unit. That's where we actually store the data and can program in different mode. Okay, so let's move on and learn a little bit more about this particular sun photometer, which is used in Aeronet. As I mentioned in the beginning, Aeronet used the same instrument throughout the network. Uh, this is what we, the latest version of the instrument of the sun photometer, what we call it sun sky lunar multispectral photometer. Okay, it is manufactured by a company called Simel Electronics. It is based in Paris, France. And the latest version of this instrument is called CE318T. We typically more commonly known as T instrument or TCML. And this is, although we use some older version of CML is still in the network, but they are all calibrated with the new instrument. 
But since 2015, since the launch of T instrument by CML, Aeronet has adopted this new version and started tra uh, um, transitioning the entire network from the older version to the new version. About 60 to 70 percent of current network uses this T version of instrument and the remaining 40 percent uses the older version. They are very similar to each other. Uh, they are only differences in their capabilities and but the data quality and the parameter which we get are same. The new instrument is capable of not only making measurement of sun, but it can also scan the sky and I'll talk about that a little bit more it how the, those measurement sky measurements are useful. But the most important is that it can actually track the moon in the night also. So we are able to get not only daytime aerosol optical depth measurement by looking to the sun, but we are also able to get nighttime aerosol optical depth measurement by observing the moon. As I said, it's a fully automated, very low power consumption. It can run on solar panel, although it has option to provide the power through direct wall power or we can use the solar power. The solar panels are being heavily used within the Aeronet network, specifically in locations where we may not have continuous supply of electricity. We often use solar panels so that the operation can be continued. The daytime uh, measurement, both sun and sky, uh, and the nighttime measurement from the moon, uh, are all used to derive these aerosol optical depth, particle size distribution, number concentration, and water vapor. And I'll talk a little bit more about the water vapor because that's one of the parameter um, which uh, we get from Aeronet, which is also used to correct the Aeronet aerosol optical depth, but we also provide that as a product. Several models uh, exist. As I said, this is a standard model, but there are uh, for a specific application, there are other types of models available from Aeronet, uh, including polarized. So people who wants to uh, use the data for other purpose to assess the polarization, there is a way to get polarized. There is a C prism specifically designed to make measurement over ocean and lake. We'll talk about that more. Uh, the instrument also come with flexible communication. It can communicate the data through satellite link, through internet by connecting to a computer, or it can also transmit data over uh, cellular phone, uh, so cellular SIM using modem. Uh, the data are like fully automated. We get the data in real time process. Uh, if the location doesn't have any of this or problem with any of the communication, uh, it has onboard data storage. Uh, it can store data for up to two years uh, in on SD card. So uh, for complicated or difficult location, remote location data are stored uh, on the SD card. And once in a while, uh, site managers or PI upload the data to your own server. OK, these are different version. As I was mentioning earlier, the one which we often use is called T instrument. It has these different channels, nine different vents, starting from 340 nanometer to uh, 1614 nanometer. All these channels have specific purpose in the Aeronet. 937 channel is used specifically to derive the columnar water vapor um, and other channels are uh, these UV channels are specifically dis, uh, put there to actually get absorbing property of aerosols and the visible channel are most commonly used wavelength. There are other versions. Aeronet also use over some station polarized model. Uh, there are two other instruments which Aeronet use in their network called C um, prism for ocean and for lake. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. If you want to know a little bit more, more technical detail, the, the link of user manual is here, which provides a lot more specific on the uh, instrument. Okay, so the instrument operation, as you can see in this particular movie, uh, it's very automated. Uh, it 
wakes up every 15 minutes, track the sun, makes the measurements in nine channels, and then go back on the, uh, it. when it is resting, the collimeter position is down, as you can see, and that is to prevent any water particles, any water vapors, or anything uh, getting into the collimeter or damaging the instrument. So this is always uh, what we call is uh, rest position. There are nine direct sun and four sky spectral channels. It takes about 10 seconds to make measurements. Uh, we also do a series of three measurements to actually screen the clouds. So whenever measurements are taken, uh, within 30, uh, within one minute of interval, every 30 second, three sets of measurements are taken. Or those three sets of measurements are actually take to uh, what we call the triplet measurements. So these triplet measurements are take, uh, we take them to actually screen the cloud from the earth because instrument has no other way to actually detect the cloud or non-cloud. So these triplet measurements are often used in uh, cloud screen algorithms to remove the cloud from the measurements. Uh, the frequency of measurement varies from 5 to 15 minutes depending on the sun angles. Uh, uh, in the morning and evening we have more frequent measurement, in afternoon we have less frequent measurement. And then the similarly we do the nighttime measurement uh, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so in addition to those two uh, direct sun and direct moon measurement, uh, we also do these instrument also capable of making uh, sky radiance in four spectral bands. Uh, those four spectral bands are basically 440 nanometer, 670 nanometer, 870 nanometer, and 1020 nanometer. Currently, we are operating in these four wavelengths, but we are actually experimenting to expand it in UV channel as well. Along the so, so these sky radians are along the solar principle plane, which you can see on the first okay uh, movie here, and then here is uh, what we call is al Alcantar uh, measurements. In uh, it, as you can see, it actually tracks the sky uh, in principal plane. Just looking, so we can capture the different scattering angles. And in the Alcantar, you are actually looking, sc scanning the sun uh, along the sun uh, angle, the entire sky. Uh, from 0 to 180 degree back and forth. And these two measurements allow us to actually uh, measure the scattered radius, uh, radiance, uh, rad radiation, uh, which is used along with aerosol optical depth measurement to derive the phase function, which is a radiative property or the optical properties of the aerosols and the size distribution and single scattering properties uh, using a algorithm called uh, developed by in a very early called Duboic and Nakazima inversion algorithm. So we use direct sun and sky measurements to actually get additional aerosol properties. And there are there we have several publications describing into much more details about this algorithm if you are interested. Okay, so let's move on to the calibration. Let's let us let us take a uh, 20 second break here before we get to the next section. If you have a question, again, put in the uh, question answer box and then we'll move on to this next slide. Okay, so the next topic, which is most important for Aeronet, it's a backbone of maintaining high quality data in Aeronet network is calibration. Each Aeronet instruments is calibrated using same method, same duration as I mentioned earlier. So there are three major steps in calibration, what we call is pre-deployment calibration. So whenever either we buy instrument or anyone else who is deploying these stations 
they can buy directly from CML. So one of the thing I want to note down about Aeronet is anyone who is interested in deploying a station around their own institution or their um, wherever their research interest lie, they can actually buy a Aeronet instrument directly from CML and then NASA will calibrate for you free of charge and we will be, and your station will become part of NASA Aeronet network. The only uh, policies is that you open your data to the public and we process all the data in real time. So before when you buy instrument from CML, before you deploy in the field or at, at any location, the instrument comes to either NASA or one of the other calibration centers. So if you can see on the map, there are a few other calibration centers all around the world. There is one which started in Taiwan. We have one in the US. This is NASA Goddard. We have a couple of them in Europe. Uh, we also have some calibration sites, which may not be the calibration center, but they are calibration site where the calibration data are gathered. So one over is Hawaii, one over is Izania, another island, because we need uh, very clean conditions to calibrate this instrument. And I will talk about that a little bit more. And in Australia, we have just another network. It's not a calibration site. So once the instrument is purchased, you do a pre-deployment calibration, which is done either in one of those uh, calibration centers. Then the instrument is sent to the field. It is deployed. It remains there for one year to one and a half year, depending on the location and the purpose. Uh, typically, the deployment period for each instrument is about 18 months. After 18 months, the instrument comes back to one of these calibration center. We do the post-deployment field calibrate post field cal deployment calibration and then the instrument is sent back to the uh, again to the uh, field for another 18 months or 12 months depending on where you are so this three step process ensure that instrument we track the uh, consistency of instrument over time, how the filters behaviors are changing, if there are dust or anything depositing in collimator or sensor head, if the instrument for whatever reason is uh, declining in the performance, then those pre post field calibration allow us to correct the data. This is very, very important for Aeronet to maintain high quality data. OK, so in order to do the calibration, uh, one of the thing, as you might remember from the equation of aerosol optical depth is the I0, which is extraterrestrial solar irradiance or top of the atmosphere solar irradiance in the particular wavelength. And in order to calculate aerosol optical depth from the measured I value, we need this I0. And this to derive this I0, we call we use a method called Langley method. And this Langley method required that the atmospheric turbidity or haziness or, or aerosol optical depth remains low and constant over time of the measurements. So in to, to ensure that we actually make uh, set up these calibration sites in very clean condition with very, very minimal aerosol optical depth. Uh, typically, they are high altitude sites. So we have two major calibration sites, one in Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, which is about 300, uh, which is about 3.3 kilometer up in altitude and very clean conditions. Uh, aerosol optical depth values are order of 0.0 to 0 0.05, uh, so very, very stable uh, site. This has been used extensively uh, since the beginning of Aeronet program uh, for calibration. All the, So we have this something what we call it the master instrument. The master instruments are sent to the Mauna Loa uh, on a regular basis. Once the instruments come back from the Mauna Loa to the Goddard or other calibration centers, uh, they are intercompared with the field measurements and then we transfer the calibration from the master instrument to the field instrument. And this process continues every six months. Um, um, the master instruments are sent back to the Mauna Loa. 
Similarly, we have another site, Izania in Canary Island in Spain, which is also an excellent site for the calibration. Okay, now let's again, calibration has a lot more details. Again, our website, when we go to the part in part two, next session, we'll discuss, uh, I'll walk you through details, documentation on all of these specifics uh, on the website, which are available. Now let's talk about the data sets. So there are two types of data sets, as we mentioned earlier, there are direct sun and moon measurement, like we mentioned earlier, uh, we use that template to do the error, uh, to do the cloud masking, and then we use this VR Lambert law to get the aerosol optical depth. Uh, once you have aerosol optical depth in different wavelengths, you can calculate angstrom exponent, which or angstrom parameter or angstrom coefficient, and then the water vapor is also calculated in nine using 937 nanometer channel to correct the aerosol optical depth. The sky radiance, which we saw earlier using Alcmacanter and the principal uh, plane uh, measurements are used to input in an inversion algorithm uh, by uh, Duboic and Nakazima uh, to actually retrieve or derived uh, microphysical and radiative properties. So microphysical properties such as uh, whether particles are sphere or not, and size distributions, radiative properties include single scattering albedo, which tells about whether particles is a scattering type or absorbing type, and then the imaginary and real part of refractive index, which is another uh, parameter to define uh, chemical compositions of the particles. Aeronet data, similar to satellite data, comes in different level. Um, level 1, level 1.5, level 2, uh, in terms of as people who are using satellite data, they are familiar that the time to time data are reprocessed using improved algorithms. So similarly, Aeronet also reprocess the data and the current level uh, data are called version 3, which was released in 2018. Uh, level 1 data are unscreened data, means it will have clouds and everything. Level 1.5 data are cloud screen and quality controlled. These are done using an automated algorithm. And level 2 data are quality assured. Uh, level 2 data are only produced after the post field calibration. So level 2 data have a lag time of about two years after the measurements is taken and about a month after the uh, calibration, post field calibration happens at one of the calibration facility. In order uh, to see the complete list of uh, all the parameters which are actually derived or provided by Aronet, you can see that link uh, below. But these are major list of parameters which are used very often by the research community. Uh, spectral aerosol optical depth means optical depth in different channels, angstrom parameters uh, using different combination of wavelengths, uh, wa columnar water vapor is also derived by Aronet, and then we have some of the d uh, inversion parameters like single scattering albedo, which tells us whether particles is absorbing or scattering size distribution. Refractive index tells you basically uh, give indication of chemical composition by looking imaginary refractive, imaginary and real part of refractive index. We also provide absorption and extinction optical depth. Uh, derived then you have phase function fine mode fractions coarse mode fraction and so on and so on uh, there are like 50 plus different parameters which are provided by Aeronet. okay now let's talk about nighttime measurement as i mentioned this new generation of instrument instrument is capable of looking moon in the night and able to make nighttime aerosol optical depth measurement. Uh, currently about 300 out of 600 stations, 300 stations have this capability to make nighttime measurement. Uh, the data are currently under research, I would say, and um, what we call is provisional data and only available at one point, level 1.5. We don't process this level data to level two. Uh, Aronet team continues to uh, refine and improve the algorithms. 
And one of the challenges is the cloud screening during night time. So our team is continuously working to develop new cloud screening algorithm to check the consistency of this nighttime data with the daytime data and using some of the LIDAR measurement during nighttime data to uh, validate. Once we are assured about the quality, and the provisional status will go away and the data will become regular level 1.5 data and then will also uh, mature to level 2 data after the full calibration. Again, uh, this link provides actually documents uh, which describe very specifically detailed description how the lunar algorithm works. OK, so. In the beginning, I mentioned a little bit uh, Aeronet not only have these permanent uh, Aeronet stations on the land, uh, but it also uh, deploys sites during field campaigns and uh, do the nighttime measurement, but there are more, more than that. We also have a couple of other component of Aeronet. One is called Aeronet OC. So the Aeronet OC is Ocean Color Monitoring Network. And this is part of Aeronet. It use one of the female uh, uh, sun photometer model, which I discussed earlier, called C Prism. Uh, it is specifically designed to make uh, measurement in ocean to actually get the ocean color. There are so this is the current uh, sites locations. Uh, these sites are typically either inland. Uh, which are on lake to get actually the lake water measurement or they are on a platform in ocean or on the coastal sites. OK, so how does this work? The Aeronet OC is not only capable of looking to the sun and the moon, but it also has capability to look down to the ocean to the water surface and make measurement of what we call water leaving radiance. OK, so. Uh, as you can see in this picture, the water leaving radiance is very, very important when you are trying to validate the satellite data specifically designed to observe ocean color or to get uh, uh, properties of how the solar radiation interact with the water surface. So. In very early, in like 2000, uh, Aeronet OC started and became part of uh, Aeronet network. Since then, uh, a lot of things have changed and the, uh, the network has grown uh, significantly. These are some of the locations of the sites. Um, we have about 2025 active sites, 20 sites are over ocean, five are lake sites, and then some of the sites are decommissioned uh, during different time of the uh, measurement. These, one of the thing I want to note down, these Aeronet sites are most difficult sites to maintain and do the measurement. As you can see, these platforms are often in the middle of the ocean, far away from the coast, they are in difficult oil and gas platforms or uh, lighthouse or various kind of platform which are in the ocean. And they are often experience extreme weather conditions, uh, continuous bombarding of sea salt particles, winds and all kind of uh, challenging environmental conditions. So to maintain and uh, make continuous measurement from these locations is very, very hard. So this, although Aeronet is making actually measurement from about 20 such locations, this data are very, very valuable, otherwise not available from any anywhere else. Uh, one more thing I want to mention here about this particular network is that although NASA manage this network, but each site uh, are actually managed by site managers or PI of that particular site, and they belong to international institutes. Sometimes the instruments is also purchased by those instrument, inst, uh, uh, institutions, and sometimes it is provided by the NASA. But the overall, the whole network is actually 
benefiting the global community uh, on the ocean ocean color uh, measurement and that is maintained by the aeronet as you can see in these pictures some of these sites are you cannot reach them directly through ship you sometimes you have to use helicopter sometimes you have to use the boat and many it, it's extremely difficult uh, stations to actually make the measurements uh, we are really lucky to have these 2025 sites around the globe to get this valuable data sets for many satellite validation including the pace mission which was just launched by nasa recently okay now another uh, very useful network or component of aerosol uh, aeronet is called maritime aerosol network or main the main is uh, done through the sun photometer which is commercially available called microtops 2 and this microtops is in a handheld sun photometer uh, works in four to five different channels depending on the configuration uh, it provides uh, ship borne aerosol optical depth measurements uh, using the sun voltmeter and depending on who is buying and uh, it can become in two different combination one is with 340 nanometers another one is one longer wavelength it's um, at 500 nanometer it in addition to this uh, microtrops providing aerosol optical depth it also has inbuilt temperature and pressure measurements so that we can get the other component of aerosol optical depth as we mentioned earlier you can connect this microtop using a gps which enables the accurate location and time of the measurement all these microtops we have about 2025 20, microtops uh, at aeronet here at nasa which are all distributed and provided to anyone who is interested in making ship borne measurement through a research vessel field campaign or through a commercial or through a private uh, ship crews um, visit our ocean so we provide to all kind of people all around the world once the crews uh, or the ship measurements are completed the instruments come back to nasa goddard we compare and calibrate against the master simel instrument sun photometer so the data quality comes from these microtops are similar to what we get from the simel sun photometer Although because of the limited channels and limited capabilities, it only provide aerosol optical depth and few other parameters. It doesn't provide all range of parameter which we get from the main aeronet instrumentation. Since 2004, uh, we have deployed this periodically on ships, uh, research vessels all around the world. Uh, and this data provides an alternative source of uh, data sets for uh, over ocean to validate the satellite retrieval and model outputs uh, these are some example of different parameters which you get from uh, main network from microtops you get angstrom parameter aod's infine and coarse mode and then uh, you can also get the precipitation water here is a bigger map showing locations of this measurement you can see uh, over last 20 plus years since the existence of uh, main network. Uh, it has covered large part of global ocean and otherwise these measurements are not available to validate uh, satellite data. So very, very important data sets comes from Aeronet, from main networks to provide valuable information over oceans, which is otherwise not available from any other ground source. Here you can see some pictures. Uh, this main is actually a great example of collaboration internationally because individual people are spending their own time and effort to make this measurement and NASA is just providing the instrument and the data uh, processing and calibration capabilities. But many people, students, researchers, uh, individuals uh, during their family trips, uh, makes all kind of uh, all the time these measurements and help us build this uh, huge data repository at nasa which is benefiting global community okay so let's talk quickly about some of the applications uh, i mentioned many of them throughout the presentation but 
specifically emphasize that Aronet data are heavily used to validate the satellite data, satellite retrievals. Uh, more recently, air quality application have started using Aronet derived product uh, for a long time to address the implication or um, the role of aerosols in climate change research heavily relied on uh, Aeronet because of the high accuracy, uh, accuracy of the data and long terms of data records. Uh, more recently, um, solar industry also started aerosol, uh, Aeronet data to actually account for uh, aerosols particles in the atmosphere and how they actually can uh, prevent uh, solar energy production uh, in different parts of the world, specifically in dust prone regions. This can become very, very uh, useful. Here are some examples of how we are actually supporting various satellite missions and their validation efforts. The first one is uh, NASA's most recent air quality missions called TEMPO, Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring Pollutions, which was launched last year's and data became available earlier this year's. This is a part of a global constellation of three air quality satellites called Gen, Sentinel-4 and TEMPO, which will be flying over US, uh, Europe and over Asia. In Tempo field of view, Aeronet has about 160 active sites uh, covering all 30, uh, covering actually out of, out of 50, 37 states in corners. And then more recently, we have actually put 10 sites in Minority Surveying Institute to bring minority students and faculties to the mainstream NASA research. Uh, these 10 sites are uh, set up by NASA through a, a ROSES competition. Uh, PACE is another recent NASA mission which is focused on uh, ocean colors and aerosols. Uh, Aeronet is heavily involved in validating both ocean color and aerosols uh, uh, from PACE. And then we have another upcoming missions in uh, which is anticipated to launch in next two years called Maya, multi-angle imager for aerosols. It is specifically designed to get PM 2.5 uh, and speciation to uh, assess the health impact of uh, aerosols particles. And it will make measurement or specific location all around the world. Our Aeronet is uh, a critical part to validate these data sets. We have set up several sites around the world to actually uh, specifically validate and collect data for Maya validation. As many of you know, uh, NASA is building an inclusive open science community through various program uh, to actually foster greater collaboration uh, in research and scientific investigations uh, by removing barriers. Uh, so Aeronet uh, stands on the foundation of open data policy, as I mentioned from the beginning, one of the uh, Aeronet data policies to make the data open uh, so that the global community can use. Uh, we have done an excellent job since the beginning of the program to make the data available through the web portal. Uh, but there's also opportunity to expand it, to reach an impact to the larger community by, uh, by providing data in user-friendly uh, formats by providing training, making more relevant data products for air quality community, for example, and partnering with the RSET uh, is one of the example or attempt for us to actually reach to the larger user community. Okay, so I think that was all about the uh, Aeronet and different components. So I'm going to quickly summarize what we learned so far. Uh, as I mentioned many, many times, it's Aeronet has produced 30 years of atmospheric aerosol measurements and we are continuing. Uh, we have about 600 active sites all around the globe. Uh, Aeronet continue to provide high quality data for various application, which includes satellite validations, um, and uh, including sensors starting from Modis, Omi, Tempo, Maya, which are more recent, Veers, and then upcoming sensors like AOS and Maya. Uh, Aeronet is also heavily used to validate, evaluate, uh, validate and assimilate into models, uh, including uh, majors model uh, like uh, GEOS, uh, 
and then uh, UK Met, ECMWF, uh, Navy model, and many others. Uh, Aronit also has been used to assess the reanalysis products such as MERA, MERA2, uh, or European uh, era. And then one of the focus of Aronit is to uh, do synergy measurement. So often, Aeronet alone does not provide complete pictures of atmosphere. So we are also co-locating our instrument with MPLNet, uh, Pandora, Tollnet, which you will hear in following session of this webinar series, and then other networks like Spartan, Skynet, uh, improve to assess their quality. Uh, the Dragon networks are very, very useful to get high spatial and temporal resolution data, which are often uh, deployed to support various NASA and NAN NASA uh, field campaigns. And then Aeronet OC uh, continue to support water living radiance, uh, which serves as a primary tool for validation, including the PACE mission. We also have quarterly newsletter, which you can access through this uh, uh, QR code. Um, and I think that's all I have. Uh, we are looking for part two. In part two, we will go over some of the application example. We will get into the website, uh, browse through different parts of the website. We look into how to download the data, how to visualize the data. We also have some Python Jupyter notebook, which we will play with the Google Colab. So if you want to actually uh, work along with us, uh, please make sure you have a Google account. Uh, and that particular Python notebook will also include an exercise to how we are using uh, Aeronet data to validate the satellite uh, retrieval of aerosol optical depth. So that is for all the part two. And one of the most important thing as I have been mentioning from the beginning is Aeronet is a effort of international collaboration. Although NASA takes the leadership in managing the networks in providing a lot of infrastructure, but it is a true uh, uh, collaborative works from hundreds and hundreds of people from all around the world, coming from many, many institutions, universities, agencies, government, non-government, private and public sectors. Uh, this picture just shows Aeronet team here at NASA Goddard. Uh, we have Aeronet site PIs and site managers who actually manage and ensure uh, that Aeronet instrument is working fine and operating and sending the data. Um, our funding comes from what we call US validation program under NASA, uh, from NASA headquarters. So I would like to acknowledge and thanks everyone actually who directly or indirectly contribute to the whole Aeronet program because without supports of collaborators and uh, global team, uh, this would have not been possible. So I would like to thanks everyone for that. And I think that's all I will move over to call for uh, homeworks and other uh, logistic for this webinar series. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta, for that introduction to the Aeronet Network. Um, just a reminder about the homework and the training certificates. The homework will be issued at the end of the last session of this training. That's on August 22nd. And the certificate of completion will be uh, handed out about two months after the end of the course for those who attend all five of the live webinar sessions and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. This slide lists contact information for myself, Dr. Gupta, as well as the RSET program and our sister programs. We also encourage you to join the Aeronet mailing list by emailing the uh, email address listed here, aeronet-join at lists.nasa.gov if you're interested in uh, receiving news and updates about the Aeronet network. Finally, here's a link to the Aeronet website. And thank you very much uh, for your attendance and attention. And we'll be moving into the question and answer portion now. All right. Thank you. So, yeah. sorry. sorry, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, 
We'll get through as many questions as we can. Any questions we don't answer live will be uh, collected in this document, which we'll post to the website uh, later. I will note uh, there were several questions about sharing the slides. Those will be posted on the website along with the recording of this training, so you can go back and look at things you might have missed. And I will note that we had several questions related to uh, climate change. If you're interested in that, that's not the focus of this presentation, but we have several other RCEP trainings dealing with climate and resilience. Uh, so we put links to that as well as the U.S. Global Change Research Program website for, for those asking questions about the U.S. Uh, all right, so we can take it away with the other questions. I don't know if, Pawan, you had specific questions you wanted to answer. Uh, otherwise, we'll just go through. Sure. Thanks, Carl. Uh, so, what we're going to do is uh, I'll pick some questions and answer them because I noticed a lot of questions earlier were actually already answered in later slides and many of them are actually also going to be uh, answered in part two of the presentation, but we will answer some of the important ones and just want to note down that uh, I have my colleague uh, Thomas Eck from Aeronet team also in the panel. So I will direct some of the question to him uh, who has a lot more experience with Aeronet. Uh, uh, he is associated with Aeronet from the beginning of the program and he can provide you more uh, uh, inside perspective. Okay, so let's see. Okay, let's go to the question three. So, Carl, are you going to read? Or yeah, I sure. Read it? I'll read them. Uh, so, the oh. question is, what's the distance between the instruments in the Dragon campaign? And this is related to evaluating the MIAC data product, which has a one kilometer resolution. Yeah, so that's a great question. So, uh, the Dragon deployments uh, distances are not fixed. It depends. Uh, it varies for every single deployment. And it depends on what is the scientific objective and measurement requirement for a particular field campaign. Uh, it can be a few kilometers uh, to tens of kilometers. Um, it really varies. Um, the one of the densest uh, Dragon deployment we have done uh, was in Baltimore DC area in 2011 as part of Discovery AQ field campaign, uh, where we have 40 plus sites actually uh, ranging from DC in the DC Baltimore metro area. So that's one example of the dense network. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we can scroll past some of these were answered in the questions. There's another question about Dragon. Uh, in terms of the difference between active and passive remote sensing, basically uh, passive remote sensors rely on an external source of energy, usually the sun. Active remote sensors provide their own energy. And we'll be learning later in this training uh, in other sessions about some active instruments as well. Uh, we can go to the question eight. Mm -hmm. So what is the region of the world that needs the sun photometers, for example, African deserts or the Mediterranean region? Yeah, so uh, that is correct. We have Africa, Mediterranean and Asia where we have less dense network. Uh, and again, we will go through all this a lot more in detail in part two and if you look the map you will see the us and europe are most densely networked currently all right um maybe there's a question about again about the maps uh maybe the question 11 about what are the constraints or requirements for establishing aeronet sites yes so there are a lot of uh, requirements which uh, one is it required a lot of resources to set up and maintain an aeronet station there is an initial investment uh, from financial perspective, but there is also commitment from the institutions who are hosting the instruments because instrument required regular checkups, maintenance. Uh, the instrument has to come to one of the calibration centers every 12 to 18 months. So we need to facilitate that part also. So there are several requirements. Again, uh, when we go to the part two, I'll talk about those a little bit more. And anyone who is interested in uh, more learning more, please email me and I should be able to provide you more specifics. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's a question about urban versus high altitude sites. They're different. There's no necessarily a preference between them. Um, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, both are valuable uh, depending on the purpose and what you're looking for. Um, we don't have any specific preference. Okay. Uh, and we're not aware of any data sets or campaigns that look at AOD at the meter scale resolution. As Powan mentioned, the Dragon networks are pretty much, uh, for Aeronet at least, the highest resolution spatial scales that were explored. Um, and then all the methods that uh, Powan presented on are detailed in a lot of different publications, and those are listed on the Aeronet website for people to look at. Um, another question, question 15, about the number of sites in India specifically. Again, next week we'll talk about how to go to the Aeronet website and get a list of active sites there, and you'll be able to use that to determine where the active sites are. Um, how about uh, qu question 16 on the level of accuracy? So uh, Aeronet doesn't measure trace gases. We'll learn about the Pandora instruments, which do in part three. But what about the accuracy for uh, aerosols? Yeah. So the aerosol optical depth, which is fundamental parameter which Aeronet provides, uh, the uh, we uh, we provide the accuracy of order of 0 0.01 in the visible, and then around a 0 0.02 in the in the UV part of the solar spectrum. Uh, and I think, let me ask Tom if he wants to add more on that. Tom, do you have more? Uh, yes, um, there's also parameters such as absorption of the aerosol. And um, we measure that to an accuracy of uh, single scattering albedo is the parameter for absorption. And we measure that to 0 0.03, it's an uncertainty of the retrieval. And that's only for optical depths that are moderate to high, so greater than 0 0.4 at 440. And then we measure um, uh, size distributions quite accurately um, for fine mode, um, probably better than point, about 0 0.01 micron radius uncertainty for fine mode um, particle radius. So that's that's what I that's all. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and then a question about ensuring the accuracy that's done through the calibration, which was discussed in the presentation. Um, in terms of the operational time frame for the instruments, I don't know if uh, you want to answer that. Yeah. So, yeah. So the the instruments, uh, depending on the location, it operates typically throughout the year. Uh, if it is in polar region or high latitude, depending on how much sun is available, if there is a snow and ice on the surface and the instruments are covered, then also it can op um, uh, stop the operation. And during monsoon season in some parts of the uh, world, if there is continuous rain, then we don't have measurements. Sometimes there can be gaps uh, when the instrument is getting calibrated. Uh, but otherwise, it's year-round uh, measurement. And for calibration, we work closely with the site managers and site PIs from individual institutions um, to get the instrument back to one of the calibration center, and then we send them back. Sometimes we send one swap out uh, of the instrument in advance so that we don't have any measurement gap. So there are a lot of combination which works, and it every site is uh, unique in that perspective. Okay, um, maybe question 20 is about what the wavelengths that these uh, AOD measurements are taken. I know there were several questions related to, you know, why do we measure at 500 and 550 nanometers specifically? Okay, so let me say this and then I'll ask Tom to add more, but I think uh, one of the reason is uh, 500 and 550 nanometer is kind of a wavelength where solar energy peaks. So if you look at the solar spectrum, that's where the, the green band, that's where the solar spectrum peaks. Uh, I think probably that is the reason where most model uh, calculation solar energy budgets uh, is uh, are using to actually assess the impact of aerosols on different climate and air quality using that particular web. Um, Tom, do you want to add anything on that? And then uh, most satellite retrievals are made at 550 nanometers. So um, the Aeronet measures at 500, and uh, we can interpolate spectrally um, between the 500 and 675 nanometer data from uh, from Aeronet to compare it to satellite data for validation of satellite data. 
Okay, thank you. Um, question 21 again deals with where the technical information can be found. That's on the website. Uh, question 22 is again about quality control that was discussed in the presentation. Question 23, I think we, we kind of answered that already. Why do we measure certain spectral channels? Uh, question 24, and I think there was another question later, is about the top of the atmosphere solar radiance. I know that uh, during the slides it was mentioned that uh, the Langley method is used. If you maybe want to elaborate on that a little bit. Tom, do you want to take it? Okay, um, we, we calibrate our master instruments for AirNet at Mauna Loa Observatory at, um, um, uh, in Hawaii. And so that's a high altitude station in mid Pacific. And the optical depths are only about 0 0.01. And the stability of the atmosphere is exceptional in the morning. So we get highly accurate calibration from the Langley method. And um, that, that accuracy is on the order of a quarter of 1%. Um, so this is um, why, we, um, why, we, why we calibrate there. It's unitless. It's top of the atmosphere signal for that instrument. And so because uh, uh, AOD is a unitless quantity also that we measure. Okay. Um, Maybe question 25 is a question about capturing local sources with Aeronet. I know this is not necessarily what they're designed to do. I don't know if you want to discuss a little bit about the limitations there. No, I think that's a great question. So it all depends on what is in the path of sun and Aeronet uh, instrument, right? So, and it's point measurement, like satellite data are typically averaged over certain horizontal space. Uh, so they cover certain footprint on the Earth's surface where Aeronet is much more like a point measurement. But the aerosols are often homogeneous in a small uh, spatial scale. So if there is a constant source of local emissions and if it is pumping aerosols in the atmospheres, then it will be measured by Aeronet. Um, it really depends on the strength of that source, um, whether we will be able to capture it or not, I think. And then like uh, mentioned here, wind directions and other factors can play a role there. Okay. Um, questions 26 and 27 are also about the, the wave specific wavelengths used. I think we addressed that. Looks like also question 28. Um, uh, question 29, it's about the shape of the earth. I don't know. Um, it doesn't really affect things so much um, for Aeronet, at least. That is correct. Um, yeah. So question 30, maybe. Um, so we know that there are, or there's evidence that PM1 is, is very closely related to health effects. Is there any relevance in the uh, data collected by Aeronet for inferring PM1 rather than PM2.5. Do you know about that? Uh, I think let me refer to Tom. Tom, do we have more sensitivity towards very fine particles, ultra fine particles? Tom, can you hear? I'm sorry, I was I was muted. Um, okay. We have um, more sensitivity to the size of fine mode particles in our size distribution retrievals. In terms of um, AOD, we, we have equal um, sensitivity to both um, fine and coarse mode particle sizes. So, um, so uh, it depends on what products being used. If it's the retrieval of the size distribution, or they're not the AOD that's being used, but um, uh, we do have a tremendous sensitivity to fine mode particle at uh, both optical depth and size. Okay, thank you. And I guess just a reminder, you know, PM1 is a mass measurement, uh, Aeronet's collecting optical depth, which is not a mass measurement, but as Tom said, uh, Aeronet is sensitive to those fine mode particles that contribute to the PM1 mass. Um, how about question 31? What about polar regions where there's a, a very shallow angle to the sun? Does that affect, how does that affect the, the measurements? Uh, I think that is again Tom's question. Um, we have actually greater sense or greater accuracy in the polar regions um, because um, of the large path length through the atmosphere. 
So the uncertainty in um, in optic aerosol optical depth measurement is proportional to um, uh, one over the path length or one over the air mass. So um, so we actually have uh, more accurate data in the polar regions, even though the optical depths are typically low there. Um, there's the ability to measure um, with higher accuracy in polar regions. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of calculating PM 2.5 from AOD, we, uh, in the introductory training, we recommended as a prerequisite for this. We do talk about that a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you want to add anything to that now or just leave it at that. Yeah, I, I think so. I don't know if that, uh, we do have some old uh, RCET training we did a number of years ago focused mm. specifically on uh, calculating PM 2.5 from AOD. So mm -hmm. I would like for folks who are interested can explore some of the RCET uh, older training, uh, I think, in before 2000. Okay. So I'll, I'll, we'll put a link to that in, in the response to this question. And again, the document's going to be posted to the website after the training. Um, we're a little bit past the scheduled ed time. We'll go, I think, until uh, 45 minutes past the hour, so another 10 minutes about. Um, and again, any questions we don't answer live, we'll write up the answers and post the document to the website. Um, here, uh, question 33 is another question about Dragon. Um, I think we basically addressed this before, but just, you know, what's the advantage of, of this high spatiotemporal network and what's the comparability to satellite footprints? I don't know if you want to add anything to that or just move on. Uh, I, I think, yeah, the bottom line is if you want to capture the uh, small scale uh, spatial variability, um, specifically in urban locations, uh, which can be high, uh, depending on different road system, different traffic pattern, different industry locations, and some of these can be very useful, actually. So I think that is one of the main main purpose to cap, to deploy these, and they can also be very useful because when you are comparing with the satellite data, often satellites uh, one pixel or multiple pixel of satellite data are compared with one particular aeronet locations. But in this case, this gives you an opportunity to average several aeronet location within the footprint of satellites. So you have a little bit better uh, measurement or uh, representation of satellite footprint from multiple aeronet site rather than one aeronet site. So I think that that helps. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, question 34, in the images of the aeronet instruments, there were two collimators. Uh, it looked like there were two collimators. So the question is, what's the purpose of the second collimator? Tom, do you want to take it? Sure. Um, the, uh, there's two collimators because there's essentially two separate instruments in one there is a silicon detector for um uh most of the channels from the uv up to 1020 nanometers and silicon cannot detect higher than 1020 nanometers or 1050 nanometers so then the second collimator is for the longer wave the longest wavelength which is the 1640 nanometer wavelength which we have an in-gas detector, Indian gallium arsenide detector. So it's a separate detector um, and a separate um, filter that's measured um, in the second collimator and that cannot be measured by the silicon side. So we essentially you have two instruments in one sensor head, um, one for the bulk of the wavelengths and the other for the 1640 nanometers. Okay, great. Um, so question 35, we answered already. Question 30, 36 about applying for more sites. I think you can reach out to, to Pawan or the other a, uh, Aeronet leads uh, with requests for setting up new sites. Uh, maybe question 37 about the standard working schedule of Aeronet. Um, how do you decide on the, the pointing angles and the schedule for the different measurement modes? Yeah, um, I think let's let Tom answer this. Okay, the schedule is dependent upon solar zenith angle, and the instrument calculates the solar zenith angle based on the latitude longitude that's entered into the instrument and based on the accurate time it gets from the GPS. So, um, solar zenith angle is used to, to measure 
uh, through the Langley period in the morning, which um, we start measurements at air mass seven, um, uh, seven path lengths through the atmosphere. And, um, and then uh, we go through the entire day based on a predetermined schedule. The AOD measurements are made every five minutes and the um, sky scans are made every hour. So we have Alma Cantor scans and hybrid sky scans that are made hourly, but direct sun measurements of AOD are made every five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, question 38 about the angstrom parameter, can it have negative values? Uh, I think yes. Uh, typically, when you have very large particle domination, then we see that. Uh, Tom, do you want to add anything? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we can't see negative values. It has to be extremely large particle dominated. Uh, theoretically, the lowest value you can get is minus 0.2, but um, we we don't see value. We've never seen values really below negative um, 0.1 from the network, um, partly because dust um, also exists in different sizes. It's not always just super micron size. There are also middle mode and, and fine mode size dust particles. Okay, great. Um, question about the, the presence of clouds. Uh, how are they removed? Uh, I want to, if you could talk a little bit maybe about the cloud masking algorithms. Yeah, sure. So clouds are detected by cloud mask algorithms uh, that is based on what we call a different measurement. So it takes multiple measurement within one minute of time interval. And those measurements are used to calculate the standard deviation in each channel. And those are used uh, to put some kind of thresholds to you to mask the cloud. So clouds are typically uh, highly variable in that one minute and aerosols are not that much variable. So that is uh, assumption we use to actually do the masking of cloud. And in addition to that, there are other uh, checks which happens in the algorithms to do that masking. Uh, for the, once the cloud is detected by the algorithm, we discard that data uh, and that is not used for aerosol AOD retrievals or AOD optical depth calculation or retrievals of other aerosol parameters. Okay, uh, question 40, discriminating between absorbing and non-absorbing aerosols. Okay, and I think let Tom answer that. Okay, that's um, basically measurements of, of sky radiances in the sky scans. And um, we have sensitivity to absorption by looking at the intensity of scattered radiation. We have the optical depth goes into the algorithm and the uh, sky, scattered um, angular distribution of sky radiances. So we have um, good sensitivity to the absorption magnitude between weakly absorption and strongly absorption, absorbing aerosols and, any, and anywhere in between that scale. Um, but the optical depth has to be moderate to high in order to have that sensitivity. So um, it's required that optical depth at 440 nanometers is greater than 0.4 to have a sensitivity that's typically useful for most scientific applications. Okay, great. Um, question 41 is about averaging between the day and night measurements. Um, I guess the, maybe the question is, is there meaning in averaging those together if you have nighttime measurements available as well? No, I'll let Tom answer that again, I think. Well, it depends. I mean, there are sites where there's a lot of diurnal variation uh, throughout the day and night. Um, it depends on what the application is, but um, often it's interesting and useful to know what the variation is throughout the day and then throughout the night. We've only recently um, taken the provisional status off the nighttime measurements. So um, there is more useful nighttime data currently available but it is still um, not as accurate as the daytime data because we can't do all the cloud screening um, techniques, uh, cloud screening checks at the nighttime data that we do in the daytime. Okay. So it sounds like in principle, yes, they're comparable, but it, it's a relatively new, the nighttime products are relatively new. So that hasn't been uh, looked into as much. Um, possible sources of, of sulfate aerosols, uh, there could be several, uh, fossil fuel burning, biomass burning, and volcanic eruptions. Uh, question 43, uh, the influence of the, or the presence of absorbing particles on the angstrom coefficient. 
Um, Tom, do you want to take yeah. it? Sure. Um, it does have an influence on the angstrom exponent, but primarily the main driver of the angstrom exponent is the uh, spectral difference in scattering uh, that that dominates the op the optical depth. Typically, uh, scattering uh, is is uh, anywhere from eighty to one hundred percent of the optical depth. So, absorbing absorption does influence the angstrom exponent, but it's more on the order of uh, typically 10% or less. Okay. Um, so question 44 is not, I think, relevant to this network. Um, question 45, uh, we talked about, you know, it, the extra parameter is calculated. It pr it's provided um, by uh, the network. Question 46 um, is about, I guess, comparability in the, in the angstrom exponent between Aeronet and Mayak data products. Um, I don't know if that's something you can comment on. Yeah, so I'm not a hundred percent sure what pair of wavelength Mayak use for angstrom mm. exponent, uh, but angstrom exponent is always calculated by using two pairs or more than two wavelengths, uh, and Aeronet provides actually uh, angstrom exponent for different pairs of the wavelength. Uh, I'm not sure what pairs uh, Mayak use, so depending on their pair of the wavelengths, uh, it can be comparable or it can be very different. Okay, thank you. And then I think we'll finish up just with question 47, just as a reminder, uh, AOD and PM 2.5 are not directly comparable. AOD is an optical measurement of the atmospheric column and PM 2.5 is a, is a in situ mass concentration measurement. So while you'll see, and we discussed in this training and We'll reference that that prior training when we talk about how to uh, maybe uh, estimate PM 2.5 using aerosol optical depth. There are methods whereby you can make those estimates. There are correlations between the two in many circumstances, but it's important to emphasize that these are not directly comparable. So you can't necessarily uh, compare the accuracies of, of them directly. So I think with that, as I said, we'll we'll um, end for this the session for today. And again, we'll post the answers to these uh, questions uh, on the website in a few days' time. So we look forward to seeing you again for part two, which is going to happen uh, next week on Tuesday. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Tom, for helping. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone, thank for attending. See you next week.